Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Uh, we'll be studying the first 16 verses this morning. And before we begin, <clears throat> I want to set the tone for our passage uh, by reading an excerpt from a letter, uh, a letter from a real person to a real group of people. The letter was from Paul, and it was written during the exact time that we're reading about this morning. So we're going to read a narrative, and it's during those historical events that we're going to read about that Paul penned this letter. Uh, Paul's time in Asia had come to an end, that spot that had formerly not heard the gospel from an apostle. He stayed there for years. Now it's come to an end, and he's on his way to visit Corinth again. Uh, remember, he had spent a year and a half there uh, a few years ago. So he's going to visit them again. He needs to rebuke them. Uh, they sinned, but he doesn't want it to be another painful visit. He's had a painful visit in the past. And so what he does is he sends Second Corinthians ahead of him uh, to rebuke them. Uh, and hopefully they'll repent by the time he gets there and he can have a pleasant visit. So after opening his letter uh, by speaking about the comfort of God, he, he has this very personal statement. This is Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. Paul writes this, he says, Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted, for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Now we read about those events last week. Uh, Luke presented them historically for us. But in the letter now, we see Paul uh, expressing his emotions. That he, was so, that he and his companions were so utterly burdened beyond their strength that they despaired of life itself. He's describing the events we've studied recently in Asia, in Ephesus. He experienced deep affliction he learned, again, the need to depend on God, to hope in God. He was reminded of the importance of prayer, and he tells the Corinthians, you must be praying for us as we continue. Paul is weak. His friends are weak, and yet they're needing to press on. And so he needs help. Help from God, help through prayer. Well, many of you uh, in this room are exhausted. You have labored for a long time. And maybe it would be an exaggeration to say that you are utterly burdened beyond your strength so that you are despairing of life itself. Uh, but it would not be an exaggeration to say that you are afflicted. You've poured yourself out in parenting. You've poured yourself out as a believer in the workplace. You've poured yourself out in ministry and in service to others. You're weak, but you know you need to press on, and so you need help from the Lord. Well, in our passage today, this is how we find Paul. He is weak. As we read his travels, we need to have this in the back of our mind. Uh, Paul is going to be urgently pressing on to more and more ministry. And, and meanwhile, while he's ministering to church after church after church, he's also penning some of his uh, biggest letters. Uh, in verses 1 and 2 of our text, he's going to be writing 2 Corinthians. In verse 3 of our text, he's going to be writing Romans. Uh, he's writing these big letters during this time of intense ministry. And it's during this time... Uh, that he is busy, he is tired, he is persecuted, and he is deeply concerned for those that he loves. We, what we're going to see in our text is three provisions for Paul, three provisions for believers that God gives him during this time. Friendship, 
comfort, and ministry. Friendship, comfort, and ministry. Before we jump in, let me pray, uh, and then we'll read our passage. Father, as we come to your word, uh, also uh, afflicted, many of us, also tired, many of us, uh, we pray that you would help us remember that, that you are good, that you provide what we need, and that you know what we need. And just like at the right time you provided these things for Paul, uh, we trust that you know us and you've provided uh, what we need to be faithful. And so we pray, Father, that you would help us be faithful. Uh, And as we come to your word, we pray that you would help us understand the history, understand where these places are and when uh, Paul is going there and the purpose of his visit and, and all of these things. Help us see and rejoice at the work that you're doing among the Gentiles in the book of Acts. In Jesus' name, amen. The first provision for the believer is friendship. This is not a new theme for us in the book of Acts. We have seen Paul need to rely on his friends more than once. Uh, Over and over, he's had his team. Uh, But as we hear about his travels in verses 1 through 6, we hear about his friends again. Uh, Verses 1 through 6, I'm going to read it all at the beginning of our point. I know it's a bigger chunk. Uh, And then we'll step through it more slowly, and I'll read it verse by verse. So look at verses 1 through 6. It says, After the uproar ceased, remember that was in Ephesus, that's what we studied last week. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Potter, the Berean son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and, we, and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Now, Our story slowed down a lot in Ephesus, right? This region of Asia that the word hadn't gone, and so Paul camps there for two years, and we get to hear several of the stories as he's there. Uh, The sons of Sceva, and uh, the burning of the magic books, and uh, all the chaos with Demetrius and the craftsmen. Well, now our story accelerates. It starts moving a lot faster as he goes from place to place, Uh, It's already almost time for his third missionary journey to come to a close. Uh, We heard his plans last week. He's already sent some of his co-workers ahead to Macedonia because he wants to visit Macedonia and Achaia again. And then he wants to go to Jerusalem and then he wants to go to Rome. He's already explained that that's his purpose. Well, we see the first part of this today, that he leaves Asia where he's been and he visits Macedonia and Achaia, or as it's called in, in our passage today, Greece. Verse 1, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. So he's encouraging those believers in Asia Then he leaves, he goes to Macedonia, he encourages the believers there as he's traveling through cities like Philippi, Berea, other places. Um, Then he comes to Greece. And if we're lining this up with his letters, uh, then it seems like he has an extended stay again at Corinth. Verse 3, there he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So if you remember on the second journey, uh, it seems like Paul intends to end this journey in the same way. Remember, he sets sail from Corinth, Kencre, that area over here, and he's going to head directly towards Syria. He just takes a stop at Ephesus for like a day. Uh, It seems like he intends to do that same thing now, but there's a plot against him. And so he needs to foil that plot by instead of setting sail from where he was, he's going to travel up northward again through Macedonia. So he's just come down through Macedonia. Now he's going to go backwards through Macedonia and set sail from up here uh, to go back to Jerusalem. 
And this is where we get the catalog of Paul's friends that are with him. So look at verse 4. Sopater, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus. And Gaius of Derby and Timothy. Now, Timothy is famous enough to not need a location, but if you remember, he was from the region around Lystra. So Berea, Thessalonica, Derby, Lystra, these are all places that Paul has planted churches. And now these believers uh, have become mature enough to become his co-workers. And he lists two more in, from his most recent place, the Asians, uh, which again means that region around Ephesus, Tychicus and Trophimus. Uh, there's at least one more friend that joins him in verse 5. He's, he's hidden there in verse 5. See if you can figure out who it is. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. Who's the friend? It's Luke, right? He, he joins again. Uh, earlier in the book of Acts, it would, it would talk about what we did and what we did, how we went from this place to this place, and then it stopped. Luke wasn't with them. Well, now we pick up Luke again. We had left them in Philippi back in Acts 16. Uh, now, as they're in Philippi and they're about to sail to Troas, they pick up Luke again. And so, verse 6, But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Now, I don't want to read uh, too much into this narrative. And I don't want to overly emotionally analyze Paul. I don't think it's our job to play psychologist or something like that with the apostle. Uh, but this is the first time that we have seen such a comprehensive list of who is with them, who is traveling and where they're from. So many places where it was Paul who brought the gospel for the first time. Uh, Derby, Lystra, uh, Thessalonica, Philippi, uh, Asia, now all of these young disciples have become mature enough to become Paul's co-workers in Christ. I don't think we can overestimate how uh, amazing an encouragement that must have been to Paul to be surrounded by these men who not just, didn't just believe the gospel, but latched onto it with all of their heart as they join his band and start to travel around with him and uh, proclaim the gospel with him. Uh, on top of that, these men have been battle-tested. Uh, they've been in the trenches together, uh, and most of them will be again, these companions of Paul. Uh, you have Aristarchus as an example. He was one of the men that was dragged before the mob in Ephesus, and yet he's still with Paul. And even after Paul goes and goes down to Jerusalem and is arrested and is sent back, sent on the boat to Rome, uh, it says that Aristarchus is still with him. Uh, even while Paul is a prisoner on the boat, Aristarchus is there with him. Um, when Paul is imprisoned in Rome and he's writing to the Colossians, uh, Aristarchus is still there, and Paul says that he's his fellow prisoner. We could say similar things about the rest of the men. Uh, during his Roman imprisonment, we hear about Tychicus. Uh, he's sent to Asia. He's sent back to Asia to, to help the churches there uh, in Colossae and in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy, you know, we've seen him all over the place, right? He's been Paul's, pa Paul's uh, faithful companion. Uh, with him through so many trials. As we bring in the tone of the letters that he's writing at this time uh, and how he, he feels beyond his strength and he feels utterly burdened and he has the weight of the churches on him as he seeks for them to grow in maturity and, and be mature in the faith, I think it's safe to say that Paul needed these friends. And that it was a blessing from the Lord to Paul to have these companions supporting the ministry, traveling with them, sometimes traveling ahead to set the scene so Paul could get there, sometimes sticking with him. We need godly friendships as well. It might be for you uh, that most of your life is joyful. Well, wonderful. Uh, you have friends that you get to celebrate with and, and rejoice in the goodness of God. But there will be trials, and Proverbs tells us that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's Proverbs 18, 24. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I want to be that friend, and I hope you do too. Uh, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We need to recognize that we need both sides of this. 
We need to be that faithful friend, and we need friends like that in the faith. We hear about both sides in another proverb. This is 27.10, Proverbs 27.10. It says, Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. You know, wise believers will seek to surround themselves with faithful friends, and wise believers will seek to be a faithful friend, even when their friend's going through calamity. We need strong friendships. We need men and women who will encourage us and challenge us and cry with us and support us in our hardest seasons. Well, this team that is sticking together, as we hear about these quick travels uh, of Paul, this team is sticking together. They're serving the Lord together. They're encouraging one another. Uh, A gift from the Lord. The second provision for believers is comfort. Uh, And it's another long section. I'm going to read the whole thing again, and then we'll go through verse by verse. But look at verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third-story window and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and had eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So we saw in this first chunk that Paul is traveling with his friends. He goes from Asia, uh, sailing across the Aegean to to Macedonia, down to Greece, back through Macedonia, and then sails across to Troas. This is the city where this event takes place. Troas is the place that um, uh, Paul first received a vision of the Macedonian man. It's the place that he embarked from to go to Macedonia the first time years ago. So he's back there. There are believers there. He stays for seven days, and near the end of this day, it's the first day of the week. It's a new week, and so they're going to get together, break bread together, the believers in in Troas, uh, and hear teaching uh, from God's Word. Paul is the teacher, and while he's there, they are going to soak up as much as they can before he departs. He, He needs to keep going. He's already been set back on his journey by having to go back by land. They want to soak up as much as they can before he leaves. So look at verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Now, it doesn't say when they started. Uh, So maybe this is a morning church service, and he's talking like all day long. Uh, But it probably is a little more likely that they started in the evening after work or something. They they got together. This was their time to be with the believers. And he started, and and he speaks for a long time, Um, uh, at least hours. In verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Sometimes, that would never happen here, uh, preachers speak for a long time. uh, And then, still longer. Uh, And sometimes, that makes people sleepy. Um, For us, it happens in a 40-minute sermon on a bright, sunny Sunday morning. Uh, So we can't be too hard on Eutychus. He was probably a teenager. It was the middle of the night. Uh, literally, it was midnight. Uh, there are warm lamps filling the room. It was cozy. Uh, Paul had already spoken for hours, and so he's overcome by sleep. He falls out of a third story window and he dies. He's taken up dead. But in his grace and in his goodness and his mercy, uh, the Lord provides a miracle to encourage the saints there. Verse 10 But Paul went down and bent over him. And taking him in his arms, said, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Now, uh, some would claim that this is not a miraculous event. 
that this is something much more ordinary. He falls out of a third-story window, and he doesn't really die. They just think he's dead, but it's Paul who runs down and listens and hears breath uh, and then runs up and keeps teaching uh, and says that he's actually still alive. Uh, but that doesn't fit the text itself. itself. Uh, Luke, the doctor, was there, and he's writing this. Uh, and he says he was taken up dead. You know, that can't mean anything besides he was dead. Uh, he, he, uh, he was dead. That settles it. Uh, that's what it says. Uh, on top of that, it, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense that uh, it would be Paul who runs down and is the one who is able to see, oh, he's still barely alive. And that the response to that is, let's all just go back upstairs and keep teaching while this guy is suffering at the, on the bottom floor. Uh, so I, I think it makes a lot more sense to interpret this as a miraculous event that Eutychus really did die. He fell out of the third, window, third story window. He died, and just like Lazarus during the ministry of Jesus and just like Tabitha in the ministry of Peter, uh, Eutychus is granted new life. It says that Paul bent over Eutychus or, or fell upon Eutychus, and, and maybe that's similar to when Elijah and Elisha both were used by God to raise someone from the dead. Uh, as they stretch themselves on that person. Well, Paul, after he does this, he comforts them. He says, do not be alarmed. There is life. And they all go back upstairs. In verse 11, when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So Paul had already been teaching a long time. They've already passed midnight. Uh, and this event happens, and then uh, they go back upstairs, and they're talking, and they, stay, they keep talking all the way until daybreak. This is a long uh, event. This is a long time of teaching God's Word. Uh, it doesn't use the word for preaching in verse 11. Uh, it, it uses the word for conversation. So I'd imagine this to be something like a Bible Q&A. You know, you can ask Paul anything, and he's answering their questions. Uh, maybe it was a uh, more normal conversation. Maybe they're just shooting the breeze. But uh, you get the picture that they're soaking up every moment they can together. Eutychus is alive, and the believers are greatly comforted. Well, the first and most obvious application of this passage is that you should never sit near an open window uh, during a sermon. Uh, but beyond that, uh, it's hard not to see the Lord's kindness in this event, right? Right? Paul is already pressing on. He's just been utterly burdened beyond his strength so that they're despairing of life itself. He's pressing on. He's still ministering. He's writing the letters. Now he's hurrying to Jerusalem. He wants to minister to that church and deliver the gift. But all along the way, he's constantly ministering and ministering all the way through the night. We see in Troas, you know this man must be exhausted. And yet you can see the Lord's goodness. Uh, how good and how joyful that there are believers there in Troas who actually want to stay up through the entire night so they can hear the word of God over and over and over. How good and how joyful that there's a place to meet and an opportunity where they can speak about the word of God and enjoy the word of God together. Uh, how crushing and defeating it would have been to have a young man fall out of a window and stay dead on such a wonderful uh, visit from Paul. And how good and how joyful it is that he was raised. God was so good to Paul, so encouraging, so comforting to Paul. And he was so good to the believers in Troas. They're never going to forget this. Uh, if you were there, you would never forget this. This is an amazing evening where they're hearing from Paul all night uh, and they even get to witness someone being raised from the dead. Well, people suddenly rising from the dead will likely not happen too often in your life. Uh, and I hope people falling out of windows is also not too common in your life. Uh, but there are still so many ways that uh, God comforts us with his goodness. God is not oppressive towards us. Just hammering us into the ground. Yes, there are difficult trials in our life, but there are also a million goodnesses that God comforts us with along the way. The embrace of a friend, 
the laughter of a child, the satisfaction of a good meal, the comfort of a home. Uh, in all of our trials, we're to see that God is the one who is good. He's the one that we're supposed to take refuge in when life gets hard. Psalm 34, David writes, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Even in trial, this is what we're supposed to see. It's God who's good. He's providing all these good and wonderful things. We run to him for refuge. Well, what a comfort for Paul that these believers were so desperate to hear the word of God. And, and what a comfort that when that led to some unintended consequences, that God was good and kind and gracious and merciful to bring life in the midst of what would have been a great tragedy. The believers went away not a little comforted. That's what Luke says. Well, the third provision for believers is ministry. Uh, the ministry itself. Uh, on the one hand, this is part of what's leading to Paul's difficulty as he's so busy and there's ministry in every place and this burden is weighing on him. But on the other hand, uh, it's such a blessing that wherever he turns, there is constantly this valuable ministry. Every city he visits, uh, he's kept busy. Uh, this ministry itself is a provision and encouragement from God to Paul. So look at verses 13 through 16. It says, But going on ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there. For so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. And the next day, we touched at Samos. And the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, as we read those verses, it, it reads like a list, right? Um, Paul is moving southward now. He, he's back over here on this coast, and he's moving southward around the, this region of Asia, visiting all these coastal cities. Uh, not to visit and encourage churches there, but just to stop because that's where the boat is stopping. Um, so the team sets sail from, for Assos while, while Paul heads there by land quickly. He meets them there, and, and day by day they travel from city to city to city. He's hastening. He's in a rush because he wants to go to Jerusalem. He's in a rush to deliver this gift but also he's in a rush. He's behind on his timing. He wanted to be there by Pentecost, it says, uh, and he had to delay by going up through Macedonia, like we read about earlier. So he's trying to get there as fast as he can. We'll, we'll see this again next week in our passage because uh, he doesn't want to stop at Ephesus. Um, he, he knows he'd be delayed there, right? He just spent two years there with the church. They love him. The, the elders love him. So what he does is he he land somewhere else in Miletus, and then sends for the elders of the Ephesians to come and visit him. We're going to be talking about their conversation for the next few weeks. Well, we saw the same thing at the end of the second journey, this haste to be at Jerusalem. And, and at the time is when he visited Ephesus the first time. Do you remember that? And they begged him to stay, but he, he needed to get back to Jerusalem. This time it's Troas. He stays and teaches for one day, but he needs to get back to Jerusalem, so he hurries on. Well, what a gift from the Lord to Paul, that wherever he turned, there is this valuable ministry that he's doing at every step along the way. He's being treasured by the believers, and he's busy with ministry. Uh, he could have stayed and had a huge impact in Macedonia and Troas and Ephesus, but in each of these places, he does minister a little bit, but he knows he needs to get back to Jerusalem to deliver this gift. Uh, Paul was in a stage of his ministry where he needed to strategically choose how he spent his time. Uh, and frankly, his choice has already been made at this time. Uh, again, around verse 3 of our passage, he writes the letter to the Romans. And, and in that letter is our scripture reading for today where he's explaining his plans. His ambition is to preach the gospel where Christ is unknown. That's what Paul has, has set as his ambition, is the word it uses in Romans. And he tells the church in Rome, that's why I haven't been able to visit you. 
it's because Christ was unknown in these regions in Macedonia and then for longer in Asia. And so as Paul is going to preach where Christ is unknown, he needs to stay there and focus on these areas. Well, he goes on to say in the letter to the Romans, he says, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. You see what he's saying there? His ambition is to preach Christ where he's unknown. He's done that in Galatia and Macedonia and Achaia and Asia, all these regions. Now he can visit Rome and be sent by Rome to Spain where Christ is still unknown. That's his ambition. That's his goal. Uh, He says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So as he's visited these churches, they've wanted to give again a gift to Jerusalem uh, like on the second journey, and so he, he considers it his duty to hasten to Jerusalem, deliver this gift before he can go to the opposite corner uh, and, and go to Rome. He asked for their prayers in his letter to the Romans that he would be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea so that he can go to Rome, and we'll see God's answer to those prayers as we study the rest of the book of Acts. So we know Paul's thought process uh, and sorry for going too detailed there if I lost you, but we know, we know Paul's thought, press. We know, thought process. Uh, we know what his plans are, and so we get it why he doesn't stay at Troas. Uh, we get it why he doesn't even go to Ephesus and he just goes to Miletus. Uh, he needs to keep moving. Now again, I don't want to over-apply Um, we know that Paul is very different from us, that he has a specific mission. We know that this this is a listing in God's providence of his travels and his unique ministry. But I think we can all agree that this is one of the great blessings of growing in maturity as a believer is that the Lord gives us all kinds of ways to be valuable in service, that he shapes us and molds us and helps us uh, so that um, we learn things. You know, we, we age out of um, being a young believer, always wanting our opinion to be heard and voiced, always wanting to be the teacher. We age and we learn the true value of listening to an older saint, of just letting them be the one who's speaking, rather than giving our two cents all the time. We learn to listen. We learn the value of prayer that we don't need to always be practically active, but we can slow down. And at any time, pray to the Lord and that this is helpful to the Lord's mission. Uh, Wherever we turn, we learn as we grow older in Christ that there are things we can do as we listen uh, to other believers, as we pray, as we serve. Hopefully this is a mark of maturity in our life, that the Lord is using us in all kinds of ways. And in different seasons, he's using us in one way and he's he's gifting us in other ways. And he's uh, in another season using us in a different way. It's a blessing to be busy with serving the Lord. But this also comes with some difficulty. Uh, Paul had to say no to staying in Troas, uh, even though they clearly wanted to hear him teach more. Paul had to say no on the second journey to staying in Ephesus, even though they clearly wanted to hear him teach more. He had to choose and weigh and keep moving because he had a, a mission from the Lord. Well, each of us, as the Lord refines us, uses us, and makes us um, valuable to one another, uh, each of us is going to have to strategize and choose things as well. Yes, I'd love to help teach that Bible study, but I really can't take any more time away from my family right now. You know, we need to have those kind of trade-offs. Uh, yes, I'd love to help with that ministry, but my schedule is already too full, and I really feel like God has gifted me in, in this way. You know, those are the kind of conversations we have as believers because the Lord has put all kinds of opportunities to serve in our life as we love one another. Well, I think there's a similar responsibility for us that there was for Paul. We need to think about these things. How am I uniquely suited to serve? What season am I in? How can I serve? How should I be used in humble service for other believers? 
We're coming to the end of our time, uh, but I hope that as you read this passage, you're reading it as more than just a travel log. Uh, it is that. We're hearing about city by city by city, how the Lord is taking Paul from place to place and ministering. But I hope that you remember that behind that history, there are difficulties and trials and hopes and concerns and relationships. And we hear about all of those things in his letters. And in God's goodness, he provided Paul during this time with friends to help him through, uh, teammates, coworkers. He provided Paul uh, and the believers <clears throat> in Troas with great comfort during a time of potential tragedy. He provided Paul the ministry itself, the encouragement of being used by God, needing to move on and move on and move on, and being used everywhere along the way. These are gifts from God. But I want to make something clear uh, if you're visiting with us today. Uh, the message of the scriptures is not take these five steps and you too will get friends and comfort and a ministry position in a church. The call of the scriptures is for you to believe in the Lord Jesus and repent of your sins so that your sins can be freely forgiven and you can have eternal life with God. That is the message of the scriptures to you, the gospel message, to believe in the Lord Jesus and repent of your sins so that you can be freely forgiven of all of your sins and have eternal life with God himself. Once that happens and your eternity is secure, then in God's goodness and kindness, he does provide us with godly, wonderful, challenging friendships. He does provide us with ways to serve him and a lot of ways to serve him. He does comfort us in all of our affliction. So as we remember this as believers, we can rejoice in this. We can taste and see that the Lord is good. We can take refuge in him like David calls us to do. We can seek to be good, faithful friends, copy uh, the way Paul's co-workers are pushing ahead together as they serve the Lord. And we can seek to serve God in the wisest way, being useful to the Lord, being busy with the things of the Lord. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this unique passage uh, to get a glimpse on the life of Paul as he uh, draws uh, this third missionary journey to a close. We pray, Father, as always, that you would help us remember the details, the places, the history, the names, so that we can see what you did during this time as the gospel went not just to Jew, not just to Samaritan, but also to Gentile, as your saving message is being spread all over the world. I pray that you would help us see that and rejoice and give glory to you. But also, Father, I pray that you would help us remember the ways, the timeless ways uh, that you encouraged Paul and the believers uh, during this difficult time. That as they pressed on, as they were weak and they needed help, um, help us be encouraged that you provided friends, that you provided kindness and comfort. You provided ministry for them to do. Help us not be men and women that, that run to the comforts of the world during a time of trial. Help us be men and women that run to you and take refuge in you. Help us be believers that challenge each other, comfort each other, and encourage each other with strong, godly friendships in the Lord. Help us press on uh, in the strength that you provide to keep being joyful, to keep honoring you. Help us be faithful, and we thank you uh, for the forgiveness that we've received in Christ Jesus. We thank you for allowing us, by your mercy and grace, to be one of your people and to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. While the musicians play, I encourage you just to take a moment and, and think back through our passage um, and pray to the Lord.